The Aurelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for our October installment of the History Speaker Series. Um, I am joined on screen here by some special people. I have Trish, who is the head of the History Committee at OMA. I have Monica, who many of you will have spoken with during registrations, um, who runs OMA in a lot of ways. And then, of course, we have Jane, who is our speaker. Um, my name is Lindsay. I'm the History Coordinator at OMA, um, and I'll be facilitating tonight. So Jane is phenomenal. We're so excited that we have her here to speak for us this evening. So Jane is uh, the co-author of the award-winning book, Destined to Survive, which um, is the wartime memoir of her father, who I believe you'll be hearing more about this evening. Um, and Jane's father was a soldier who was captured in the Dieppe raid during World War II. Um, and was a prisoner of war in Germany. Jane, uh, also for the past 20 years, has worked at the Aurelia Public Library as the Community Services Coordinator uh, and Organizer of the Genealogy Club. So we are absolutely thrilled to have Jane here with us tonight uh, to be speaking. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand it over to Jane for her talk this evening. so much. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm hoping technically everything's okay here. Uh, looks okay from my end. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honor to do this presentation on something that means so much to me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This year marked the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid. The tragedy didn't begin and end on August 19th, 1942, but still carries on today. I traveled to Dieppe with a group of 25 people, mostly descendants of these heroes. We walked in their footsteps, placed photos and flags on their graves, and read every man's name on the beach, ending with a toast. People often ask me why I'm so passionate about Dieppe. Why have I spent every single day for the past seven years searching for these men? I'm determined to make sure that these men are remembered. They had little chance of success on that beach, and they were sent in like lambs to slaughter. They bravely tried to do their duty until the end, and because I'm a Dieppe kid. The brief story I'm about to share with you is about my father, but it could be about any one of them. So um, this is our tour. Um, standing on the beach, standing in the cemetery, the beach has this feeling that I can't put into words. And I know a lot of people have felt the same thing. It's it's a feeling of sadness. It's a feeling of overwhelmingness, um, pride in what they tried to do and sadness, a horrendous sadness and fury at what they were expected to try and do. So this is my father, the inspiration for what I do with my project I'm about to explain to you. Um, but I can't forget the men who were attached to the royals. This uh, took a little while to figure out at the very beginning of my project because a lot of the men who were in a different regiment kept saying they were, had landed with the royals. So we thought they were with the Royal Regiment of Canada. There were Black Watch, 3rd Light Anti-Aircraft, 4th Field Regiment from the Royal Canadian Artillery, and others, and I'm up around nine, or sorry, uh, 700 soldiers now. I started with 554. 
So this is my father and some quotes he used to say quite often. We were sacrificed on that beach. It's not only the men. Imagine the loss of equipment that day and the blow to Canada's military. The Dieppe raid will disappear in time. The memory of those men buried over there will fade away. My three kids can tell you the story of Dieppe, but the kids across the street know nothing. So I promised dad the day that he died that I would continue to tell the story of the Dieppe raid. 1939, Canada declares war. In 1940, the Royal Regiment of Canada is on the Empress of Australia heading for Iceland for a few months and then on to England for training. They trained in Southern England and the Isle of Wight for two years and were just eager to get into the action. The Canadians had not really been used for um, any um, action or offenses and they were just itching to get in there. 1942, Hitler's Germany had taken over most of Europe. So the, the Royal Regiment let out a great cheer when they found out they were going on a raid to Dieppe, codenamed Operation Rudder, July 3rd, 1942. The weather wasn't cooperating. The troops were on two troop carriers waiting in the channel for the weather to cooperate. And then on July 7th, four German bombers came in, swept in low and attacked the ships. Of course, they couldn't use the ships because of that, so they took all the men off and put them back on the Isle of Wight, and they said the Dieppe raid was canceled for all time. They sent the men on seven days leave, and when they got back, the Dieppe raid was resurrected, and it's now scheduled for August 19th, 1942, with a new code name of Operation Jubilee. This time, there was no cheering. The men were told they could write a letter home saying goodbye, and it would only be mailed if they failed to return. So this is a map of the, where the Canadian regiments uh, landed. There were also some British commandos and 50 American Rangers. Um, but this is just to show you uh, where the layout was. So Green Beach over in Poorville, South Saskatchewan's and the Camerons. Uh, Main Beach was Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, Essex Scottish, Fusilier Morial, Royal, and of course there were some commandos there too, and the Calgary tanks landed on the Main Beach. Off to the left and on the very worst of the beaches is Blue Beach or at Puy where the Royal Regiment of Canada landed. So A and B Company of the Royal Regiment landed in the first wave right in front of this house. Now, if you pay attention to this house, you're going to see it a little bit more. It was where most of the firing was coming from. C and D Company, my dad was in D Company, they landed in the second wave. So they didn't know if, the, if any of the A uh, or B Company had made it inland. So they landed C and D anyway. And that was a catastrophe. And of course, E Company is sitting out here waiting for the third wave with part of the Black Watch and they were landed way over here. The Royals objective was to briefly invade the German occupied port at Puy, codenamed Blue Beach, destroy specific gun positions on the headlands between Puy and Dieppe and return to England as quickly as possible. But then everything went wrong. A German convoy heading for the port of Dieppe had intercepted the third commando's landing crafts. Gunfire suddenly erupted to our left. The Royals had to turn in circles for over 20 minutes to avoid detection. We needed the element of surprise and the cover of darkness to penetrate the German defenses and, and advance inland. Now it appeared that we would be landing 20 to 25 minutes late and in full daylight. As we landed, we were under a continuous stream of heavy machine gun fire, and as the ramp was dropped, the firing came straight into our landing craft. I heard a voice yell, run, Poulton! As I turned to go to the right, I could see what seemed to be a tank turret that was built into the wall. I threw myself down beside a shallow abutment, hoping it would give me some cover. 
Jack was carrying 12 high explosive two inch mortar bombs in his backpack. And when he flew himself, like threw himself down on his stomach, his backpack was sticking up, waiting for snipers to hit it. So he had to get it off his back. As the smoke screen was clearing, I emerged aghast at the carnage before me, and I knew I had landed in hell. So this is what my father saw when things, the, the smoke cleared, and all it was was bodies everywhere. Um, this is the house. I'm not sure if my mouse is working to show you, but if you look up at the top left-hand corner, the house there was taken over by the German army. It um, had been the house of Dumas, who was a playwright in France. And over to the left here is a bunker. You're going to see it a little bit better in a minute. And a Tobruk. And there's bunkers, concrete bunkers everywhere along this, along the cliffs, along the seawall. It's insane how many bunkers were there with the Germans being protected in behind solid con concrete. And the other thing about Dieppe, most beaches have beautiful sand. Some of them have white sandy beaches. Dieppe has rock. And those rocks are like quicksand. The first time, I've been there four times. The first time I was there, I actually had a meltdown because I couldn't believe anyone could be stupid enough to land 700 men on a tiny little beach with rocks because you can't get your footing. Um, it's it's just crazy. And then of course, when the, when the um, mortars hit the rocks, it became shrapnel. And so we did an experiment where we chipped off the rock and that is what came out. It's like flint, it's like what they would have used for arrowheads. It's, it's insane, it's crazy. It was heart-wrenching to see the blue patch of the second division, which we were all so proud of, ripped, torn and stained with blood. The tide was coming in and drowning the wounded. The Germans ordered a surrender three times with no hope in sight, they finally surrendered. I witnessed this past August when I was over um, the tide coming in. I had never seen it before. And it came in very fast and furious and went right up against the cliffs. And I just can't imagine those poor men lying there knowing that they were going to drown and they couldn't move from wounds. It must have been just, I can't even, it was horrifying for them. Within a few hours, the fighting had ended. Okay, so here's some pictures of the beach. Um, if you look at the top left-hand picture here, there's a pier. My dad tried to go to the right. Dieppe is to the right. So he thought if he could get through, he could make it over to the main beach. But there was a machine gun right on this pier firing across the beach from that angle. Over to on the bottom picture on the right, you'll see the White House at the top. And then where the box is here was a bunker that has now fallen onto the cliff, uh, sorry, from the cliffs with the erosion onto the beach. And there were other bunkers along here and they were hidden in caves. It was just utter, just annihilation of these poor men coming off these landing crafts and just fire everywhere. There was nowhere to get protection, nowhere to get cover, except being up against the cliff. The bottom left-hand picture here, you will see what the view is from that house. And this is a tour group from our 75th. And you can see a sniper would have no problem hitting those people individually. That's the height of the cliff that they were supposed to scale. And this is another shot of the beach. This was after the, um, the raid, um, but you can see how the tide has started to come in now. Um, it's just the worst place to land a group of men anywhere in the world, in my opinion. So the concrete pillboxes made it impossible for them to return fire at the enemy. They couldn't see the enemy. Um, this on the bottom right, uh, this 
has been turned into the monument. The monument is right to the right here. Um, this uh, photo at the top here is the bunker that has fallen off the cliff. But again, you can see the concrete. It's not an inch thick, it's a foot thick, it's crazy. Um, I, I can't imagine, this was Hitler's Atlantic Wall and um, they were so prepared for an attack by having all of this, just this protection, they couldn't, an enemy couldn't get at the German army at all. Whoops. Um, so this is another shot of the beach with the house up on the up on the cliff. So we were able to go into the bunker at the house uh, several times again this August. If you look on the left here, that is the slit that the rifles were being stuck out of to shoot the men on the beach. There's no way you could retaliate and hit anyone. Like you'd have to be a super sniper to be able to get through that little tiny window. Um, again, uh, middle picture, this is the thickness of the bunker. Um, the, on the right is the Tobruk. Um, it's like a hole in the concrete. Here I am sticking my head up out of it. Uh, this is where most of the snipers were hanging out. And look at the view they would have had from this hole down to the beach. This is the tide in, and there's some remnants on, like we were up on uh, the top of the cliff here at uh, the bunker on the right, we were able to go in, but this bunker wasn't built until after D-Up. So I guess they thought they'd better step it up and build more bunkers. This thing is phenomenal. It has rooms. Um, it has this big staircase thing around the corner here. And the top right-hand picture is what it looked like with the gun on it. Um, apparently the gun was left there in the 50s and the children used to come and climb on it. So this bunker was buried in sand and the man who owns the house is from Holland. And he, he bought the house and was trying to build a garden in the backyard and kept hitting concrete. So the archaeologists came in and they dug it up. And it's only been accessible, excuse me, since 2018. And it's it's phenomenal. And this, this man is allowing people to go in and have a look at it. But there's also on this property, so we're this remnant of, um, I think that might have been where the tank turret was that my dad was talking about. But on this property, on this gentleman's property, there's also another bunker to the left of here. And he thinks it's connected to a bunch of um, tunnels. So again, this wasn't done in a week. This was done as soon as they took over France on, until they occupied from the beginning of the occupation of France. So 554 soldiers from the Royal Regiment of Canada landed on Blue Beach. 229 were killed in action, died from wounds, died as POWs or died shortly after repatriation. Two hundred and sixty four royals were captured and became prisoners of war. So again, I'm concentrating on the Royal Regiment, the others. Most of them were captured as well, and many of them were killed. There were very few to get off the beach and back to England. So the POWs were, including my dad, Jack is now a prisoner of war. So once they were taken prisoner, they were allowed to go back down to the beach. My dad was allowed to go back down with a stretcher to move some of the wounded as the tide was coming in. And he looked up as he bent down to speak to a wounded man and he saw a German officer walking from place to place shooting the worst of the wounded in the head to put them out of their misery. And this was a quote, a quote he always said, you can train a soldier to fight and you can train a soldier to accept death, but there is no way to prepare a soldier to be taken prisoner. 
The experience can only be understood by one who has been through the humiliation. So Dieppe Raid was the Canada's darkest day of World War II. And at the end of the day, 907 killed, 1946 taken prisoner. The Royal Regiment of Canada suffered the heaviest casualties. Nearly 500 families received telegrams informing them that their royal was missing in action, presumed dead. The royals and the other prisoners, the prisoners of war from Blue Beach only, were taken up to Puy and they were put into this courtyard at Paul Bear School. We visited um, in August and I visited five years ago and the headmaster knew that there'd been prisoners in the courtyard because the Germans were using this as billets and the, stu the students were made to uh, go in the hallways. Their classrooms were in the hallways so the German soldiers could have the rooms. But the headmaster didn't know that an allied Spitfire came over this courtyard, saw some German soldiers and assumed they were Germans and shot up the men, the POWs, our POWs in that courtyard. There were two killed and very and many, many wounded, some very seriously. The first night they were put into an unfinished clock factory. We visited it as well. So this is the roof. Um, it's very unique. And my dad had the first night we got together to work on his book. This was the first thing that he had said. That first night will remain in my mind forever. Dying of thirst, I had scraped a hole in the dirt floor and pressed my tongue and parched lips to the damp earth. They hadn't had a drink since they left England. My dad had been submerged in salt water. Um, I, I can't imagine. Uh, they had one tap for 2,000 men and they turned it on for a short time. And obviously my dad wasn't able to get a drink. Then they were put into these train cars or cattle trucks. They were crowded in shoulder to shoulder. There was no room to lie down. They either had to stand or squat. They were given a round loaf of black bread about 10 inches in diameter, as well as another sixth of a loaf. The bread was to last them five days, but they didn't know it. There was a bucket in the middle that was to be used as a latrine. There were wounded in with them, and by the time they arrived in Germany, their wounds had become badly infected. So the POW train traveled all across Europe for five days so they could show off that they had nearly 2,000 Allied soldiers that had been captured by the German army. And in white paint, they had painted along the cars, Churchill Second Front Kaput, as they wound their way through Belgium. Um, there's there was actually a ceremony in Belgium in August where they were paying tribute to the POWs that had stopped in the train, had stopped in this small town. Um, they allowed them out, but it, it was super, super hot that day. And they all stood in the heat without food or water and these people in Belgium have not forgotten and they pay tribute to them. And then most of them ended up in Stalagate B, Lambsdorff, Germany. So this is now in Poland. It's uh, Binowitza, Poland. We visited here in August as well. Um, this is the Canadian compound. If you see the 22 and the 21, the Canadian huts were from 18 to 22. Um, they were A and B, so they were divided down the middle, uh, but they had very little food or little water, infestations, cruelty, loneliness, boredom, cold, humiliation, punishment, forced work, disease, and an uncertain future. And they were there for nearly three years. Um, they dug a tunnel under 19B, the Canadians, it was closest to the road, but there were some spies in with the Canadians, German spies, and they um, the Germans showed up one day and knew exactly where to find the tunnel and had the prisoners fill it in. 
So this is a propaganda photo. This is my dad with his arms crossed saying, you know, stuff it. Um, they took these propaganda photos, cleaned the men up, especially before the Red Cross would come to do inspections because Canada was part, Canada and Germany were part of the Geneva Convention. So they had to treat the prisoners in certain ways, but they didn't always do that. But um, they took all of these pro propaganda photos and I've been trying to collect them. Some families have uh, shared them with me or scanned them and trying to identify as many men as possible in these. So then the Dieppe prisoners of war are shackled. So it began with ropes. They had their wrists crossed in front of them and had their hands tied. And then they brought in these shackles. It was because of uh, they were, it was in retaliation for a British order at Dieppe that the German prisoners' hands were to be tied. There's a few different stories about this. One is that some German POWs were found, bodies were found washed up with their hands and feet tied. Um, but this is what Hit Hitler said, they were to be tied up and they were to be chained. So from six in the morning till eight every night, they had to wear these shackles. And I've held them, they're very heavy. Um, but the good thing is they figured out how to get them off with the little key from the sardines or the bully beef tins. As long as they didn't get caught without them, they could remove them to put their coats on or take their coats off, et cetera. And then came the death march. January, so this, these are the dates that my father was on the death march. There were several death marches across Europe. Um, his was January 22nd and he walked uh, 1,500 kilometers until April 12th when he was liberated by the U.S. 9th Army. Uh, my dad grew up in Kaposkasing, so he knew how to handle the cold. Some of these men came from warm climates. Um, some of them died. Some of them got frostbite, but it was horrendous, and a lot of them didn't make it. Many of them um, died from exposure, lack of food, whatever. It was hard to pick out the dead from the living. As we walked away from Stalagate B, I didn't even turn around to have a last look. The weather was below zero and there were banks of snow up to four feet high along the side of the road. We passed many men who had frozen to death the day before. To fall by the wayside, you would be shot. We were strafed by allied planes as we staggered along the roads. The ones who survived had to throw themselves into the ditch to avoid the planes. So that is what they went through. Um, the reason why I always say Diap didn't end on August 19th is that these men came home broken. And when my dad said that he thought, and many of them thought they had been sacrificed, the rocks, the cliffs, no softening up of the enemy. They studied obsolete aerial photos. Aerial reconnaissance failed to notice underwater minefields and gun placements, pillboxes, machine gun nests, barbed wire. They also failed to notice that the Germans patrolled the waters. The Atlantic wall was already built. A series of mistakes happened. Element of surprise is necessary for success. It was lost and the Royals landed in daylight and communication between the beach and the commanders failed. So were the Canadians sacrificed was the raid meant to fail. So as a tribute to my father and the other Dieppe veterans I had known growing up, on November 11th, 2015, I created a project to ensure every man who landed on Blue Beach would be remembered with a photo and a bio in both a commemorative book as well as digital files available for future research. So it seems simple enough when this got started. I like genealogy. I know how to research. I love to research. And, you know, finding a photo in the bio, that was, you know, going to be pretty simple. The men who were killed in action, that was pretty straightforward. Their files are online. Um, the POWs were a different story. I had to find newspaper clippings. I had to locate family members. Um, Library and Archives Canada is very backed up with supplying uh, requests. So 50 files that were requested 
in 2018 have still not arrived. And um, because I had to start locating family members, we created a website. So we're finding people that way. We're finding them on Facebook and other social media. And just by sheer luck in some cases, but the project turned into so much more than just a research project. I've been in touch with over 250 Dieppe families. And as I mentioned, many have traveled to Dieppe with me on tours. So I wanna explain some of the things that happened after Dieppe. So telegrams arrived. Uh, their son, their husband, their uncle, missing in action, presumed dead. So look at these dates. This is approximate, but August 19th was the day this happened. And it wasn't until about August 24th that the missing in action telegram started going out. So at the beginning, the news were reporting that Dieppe had been a success. And then it started filtering out that it, was, it had been a colossal tragedy. And so families are waiting trying to find out what's going on, and then they get a missing in action notice. December 5th was when most of the killed in action were confirmed, not all of them. If anybody had been blown to bits or bodies floated away, it took years. And the prisoners of war, months and months. And what did they do? As of August 19th, the government shut off the soldiers' pay. So until they were confirmed POWs, the, soul, the, the pay was stopped. And some of the wives, the mothers, depended on that pay. There were houses lost. Um, women had to go to work uh, with ch lots and lots of children. Uh, it was a big, it wasn't just a shock losing their family member, but all of a sudden their whole lives were turned upside down financially. So I have created through this project, not me specifically, but it's just happened, a community of what I call Dieppe kids. So there's this certain emotion, and I'm pretty sure there's a few that are on this um, presentation as audience tonight, and I'm going to tell you a quick story in a minute about two of them because it's an incredible story. But there's this emotion that's deeply rooted. It's you can't put your finger on it, you can't explain it, but it's like we have this connection. If you find out someone has a connection to the Dieppe raid, whether they're POWs, they've lost somebody, there's this unspoken understanding. And through the people I've met, these are some of the quotes that I've been told. I can now forgive my father. Thank you for honoring my father who was killed at Dieppe. We never had a funeral and we weren't even allowed to mention his name. Mothers writing countless letters. I'm sure I saw my son on the news clip. Why aren't you telling me where he is? There was a woman who left the porch light on for her son who had been killed until she passed away in the 70s. They fought for pensions. They weren't given pensions. A daughter of a Dieppe POW, Lynn Beal, fought, she's a psychiatrist, she fought for pensions to get them PTSD pensions. 80% from what I found of the POWs died in their 40s and 50s for all different types of medical reasons. Many of these men would cry every August 19th and the families didn't know why. They never spoke about it. Can you answer some questions for me? POWs coming home and finding that their children had been taken by children's aid. The project has also provided closure for some families. I had one daughter that didn't know her father had been a POW. And when I explained and showed her the proof, she said, now I know why my father was the way he was. So here's some other quotes. I asked dad about Diep. He didn't answer. He got up and left the room. I never asked him again, and I've never gotten over it. The memories are so painful, sometimes I can't get families to even respond or speak to me. Many royals have had their ashes spread on the beach or have the royals crest on their headstone, and they were only with the royal regiment for those wartime years. Some of them didn't sign up till 41. 
I've heard of Alzheimer's patients acting out as if still in the POW camp. So the memories have come back, haunting memories. They're storing food under the mattress. They're sabotaging their rooms. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. And they were never given permission to wear the medal, the France and Germany star. They advocated for 30 years. So they never got a medal for what they went through. And after all the advocating, a Diep bar was finally created. And that's what you see here on the medal. And then of course, post-traumatic stress. So this is my father doing an interview in Ottawa on his way to Dieppe. The only trip he ever got for free was the 50th anniversary, excuse me. And he went every five years beginning in 1962 to pay tribute. Um, you can just see the emotion of him talking about this. After we wrote the book, actually it took us five years to write the book because dad had to keep getting up and leaving. And I, I didn't understand at the time. Um, I, I thought I'd said something wrong or, or said something to make him mad. And he'd go away and he wouldn't come back for a couple of weeks with his notes to start up again. So it took us five years of starting and stopping and starting and stopping. But when it was on paper, and Dundurn Press wanted to publish it, it was like he purged all of that onto paper and he became a different man and he could handle life a little easier and he could speak to, in public to groups, which is when I started going with him. And every night before he would go to a talk, he would get a migraine headache because he had had nightmares. Bringing all of those memories back, he had had nightmares. I found out later that doing the book, he was having flashbacks about things. Smells would bring flashbacks. Um, they, some of them had anger issues, alcoholism, suicide, abuse of family members. Families are still dealing with this 80 years later. And intergenerational trauma is believed to pass from one generation to the next. There's been some studies on this. Perhaps the children and the grandchildren of the Dieppe veterans are dealing with this. So I would like to just uh, make mention of a story with uh, possibly two people that are watching right now. Um, a couple of years ago, a gentleman in California uh, got a hold of me, and I'm not even sure how. I'll have to double check this with him later. Um, I think he read my dad's book and found our website. And his grandfather was Walter McGarrigal. He was in the medical corps out of Guelph and had gone in with the Royal Regiment on Blue Beach. He, at the time, I didn't know that he had this very good friend named George Proctor. It didn't come out right at that point. So I'm going through my list of, of POWs, trying to locate family members to get pictures and contact them to find out information. And a friend of mine in Uxbridge is very into remembrance like I am. And I asked if she could hunt down. I managed to get George Proctor's obituary and I found some names of family. And I asked if she could try and track down this woman named Linny Brown. What happened was this incredible experience because Linny Brown's father was George Proctor Paul Swatzel's grandfather was Walter McGarrigal. They had been best friends. Whether they met before Dieppe or in the prison camp, we don't know. At some point, I hope to figure that out. But they had become best friends. And George had actually helped save Walter's life by carrying him on the death march. We believe it was the death march. And I was able to bring these people back together again. They had been friends when they got home. The families used to get together, but the McGarrigals moved to California and the Proctors weren't able to go because George Proctor passed away and they had lost touch. The most incredible thing was traveling to Dieppe with Paul and Linny and Linny's son, Jordan, and seeing the three of them standing on the beach together after 80 years, it was the most amazing thing. So that's uh, basically 
how I feel about the DEAP raid. Um, this project is a labor of love. If you know anyone who was at DEAP or if you ever hear somebody say, my grandfather was at DEAP, please have them contact me. We do have a Facebook page. We do have a website. Pay tribute to these men who sacrificed it all. Thank you so much. Jane, thank you so much for sharing all of your work and all of your research with us. The work that you've done is remarkable. I'm, I'm just blown away every time I hear you talk about it, um, by how much, how much time and research and dedication has gone into this. So thank you very much for sharing with us tonight. You're very welcome. We only have four um, of the men who were killed left to find pictures. And I think we have like 10 of the prisoners of war left to find. That's so scary. still working on it. <laughs> so close. <laughs> so close. <laughs> All right. Well, as I said, folks, um, if you do have any questions for Jane, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, and we do have a question here from DM, our partner over at Rogers. When you are talking about the death march, um, is that what the actual purpose of it was? No, um, I'm really sorry I had to kind of take, you know, all of this information into 45 minutes because I could have explained a bit more. Um, as the Allies and the Russians were advancing towards the end of the war, the Germans, for some reason, they called it evacuating the camps, but that's not why. They weren't doing it as a good thing. Um, they were trying to stay away from the allies or like the, especially the Americans, because the Americans were advancing um, and the British and the Russians. And so they made these, all of the POW camps empty. Um, some of the camps, uh, the, the men were on working parties. And so these marches, or they called them marches, they weren't really marching, they were staggering, were all over Europe. Um, my dad's, we followed it in 2010 in a car, and that's how we know how long it was, um, and 1,500 kilometers. So every day they would do like 20 kilometers, and then they might have a day of rest, but they would pass people from the concentration camps on these marches. So it was almost like they didn't want them to find the camps filled with these people. And there's many reasons why over the years it's been brought out why they did this, but it wasn't specifically for them to die. It was to try and stay away from the advancing allies. I see. Thank you. Uh, question from Nancy. Can you cover the reasons why the Diet Raid may have been meant to fail? Um, hmm. Well, I didn't get into some of the reasons why um, I could have done that. I'm sorry, but it would have taken a lot of time. Um, they were trying to prove that it, to Stalin, to Russia, that a second front was impossible in 1942. Um, there's many, many reasons why people think the Dieppe raid happened. The latest uh, friend of mine who's an author and a professor, David O'Keefe, has found in the British archives, if you've read his book, One Day in August, um, a connection between the commandos coming in on the left and the right of, of the beach I showed you with the Canadians, um, that there was supposed to be a pinch hit with German Naval headquarters in Dieppe. And there was an Enigma machine in there. So Bletchley Park had cracked the three rotor Enigma, but every time they seemed to get ahead, the Germans would create something better. So there was a four rotor Enigma, um, but everything went wrong. So his theory, and he's proved it with a lot of documentation is that if it would have been successful, 
the British uh, commandos would have been able to sneak in and grab the Enigma and any paperwork, et cetera, et cetera, in German naval headquarters. But I, I'm at a loss to tell you why. Um, again, my dad just thought they had been sacrificed to prove that it wasn't possible to do any major damage in 1942. And they were always told that they learned valuable lessons that were, you know, save men when the actual invasion happened June 6, 1944. So um, I just wish it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> that's, that's my opinion. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to put into um, perspective why it was done the way it was. For sure. That answers uh, Dave Town, one of our other fabulous speakers questions, <laughs> asking about the Enigma machine. Um, and Dave and Sue, who uh, were asking about the political reasons behind the raid. Um, so let's see what else we got here. They've been pouring in. Um, oh, another from Dave. Can you tell us where the death march started and ended? Okay, well, my my father's particular march started, so he had been out on a working party out of Stalagate B in Lambsdorff, um, trying to make an escape attempt, and it didn't work. He got cap recaptured, so they were brought back to 8B, and when he got back there, most of the DF POWs had been moved to a different camp called Stalag 2D. Um, there were also, I should make mention that there were some uh, Diet POWs who were badly wounded that were taken to Stalag 9C. So my dad was in 8B in Lambsdorff, and the march started for him at Lambsdorff and ended way up in northern Germany in a place called Dittfurt, which is... Um, sort of around Frankfurt um, and it, and they went back and forth. They, they wound right and left and right and left trying to stay away from the advancements. Um, so that's why it took so the 1500 kilometers. But yes, it started at Lambsdorff, ended at Dittfurt, Germany. Um, question here from Mary who says, my dad was a signaler attached to the Colonel of the Essex Scottish. Wow. Uh, he was the president of POW. Sorry, there's a lot of short forms. <laughs> Nova Scotia branch. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> um, how do I confirm that you have his details? Um, well, first of all, I'm concentrating right now on the Royal Regiment only. Um, I am in touch with various other uh, museums and organizations. So the Essex Scottish, for example, I am in uh, connected to them and I um, am in touch with them quite a bit. So if you would like to email me, um, the email is just dietbluebeach at gmail.com and give me the particulars. I can make sure that the information gets over to the Essex Scottish um, group. They're out of Kingsville, I believe. Uh, that's where the museum is. And I will make sure, because I'm trying to encourage the other regiments to do what I'm doing. Because our generation has the knowledge. Beyond us, it may never happen. So that's why I'm pushing, because I'm getting older. <laughs> I want to get it done. Um, and actually, we have Martha, who's commented that um, her father was also a signal signalman with the Essex Scottish at Oh, wow. And celebrated okay. his 21st birthday in a POW camp. So, Oh, my goodness. Yes, both of you. Could you please get in touch with me? I'd love to speak with you. For sure. Um, we have a question here from Anne. Was your father friends with others from his regiment post-war? Um, and did he share stories with you or only once you started work on your book? Okay, first question, there was an organization called the Dieppe Veterans and Prisoners of War Association. Um, they got together, My, we, we lived in Toronto at the time, so it was basically Toronto, but it was all across Canada, it was a national group. So yes, um, I started this project by trying to hunt down uh, descendants of some of the men I remembered. Um, they used to come to our house 
There was one in particular who was very badly wounded. He had so much shrapnel in him that he used to set off all the machines at the airport. And he used to scare me by lifting his shirt up because they had literally just taken the flesh and cut, you know, crossed it over, stitched it up. Um, and I used to run away screaming when everybody laughed and thought it was funny because I was very young compared to my brother and sister. Um, but yes, he kept in touch with quite a few. Um, and the organization was very, very vibrant at the time. Um, they did a lot of wonderful things, putting up monuments, raising money, taking tours over. Um, yeah, so um, definitely kept in touch. And my dad used to talk about certain things, not, you know, not the really tragic or horrible things. And he also told me when we were doing the book that he there's some things he couldn't tell me, that they were too horrible. Um, he would make jokes about things. He picked up quite a bit of German. So, you know, he would speak to us jokingly, loudly in German. And my friends would go, what the heck is your dad doing? Um, and then, I mean, everything I did in my childhood, all my projects, my speeches, everything I had to do was about Diep. This has been rooted in me since I was a baby because I used to be taken to uh, the, the cenotaph on August 19th and November 11th. So um, he did speak, but some of the men, some of the families I've been in touch with, some of the men never even brought it up. And, and so I've been able to answer those questions, which is just, it's amazing that some of these families can get closure from it. Certainly. Um, okay, I'm just going to take a few more here, Jane, if that's okay with you. Yeah, for sure. Um, Barbara is wondering, um, can you give her some ideas as to where she could get information on the medical corps from Guelph? She, oh. will, she has family members who are part of it. Okay. Um, again, get in touch with me because I'm on the hunt right now. <laughs> um, it's difficult. And um, I do have some... Uh, newspaper clippings that I have scanned over the years in the file for the medical corps. So you may be lucky and there may be information in that. Um, I would like to connect Paul Swatzel from California with a man named William Sugar Kane. That was his nickname um, because I'm hoping his family has more information to help put Walter McGarrigal's story together. So it's like a puzzle. Every piece of information you get fits in and then you find another piece and then you compare them and they fit. Um, but yes, get in touch with me and I'll see what I can do for you. Very cool. Um, Chris is wondering, are any of the veterans from Dieppe still alive? And if so, have you had a chance to visit with them? So our last Royal, I, I call them Royals, they call them Royals, Royal Regiment, um, his name was Campbell Brown. He died at the very beginning of COVID in March of 2020. Uh, he was 98. He was a Toronto police officer. So the ones who were left, the Royal Regiment, um, Ron Beal was in Sunnybrook. He was a friend of my dad's. I went to talk to him. I told him about the project. Uh, he All he said was, thank you. And then he kind of looked off into the distance and he said, I think I'm tired of talking about Diep. He had been the president of the association and was always the media person. Um, Lou Pantaleo was in a nursing home in Barrie here where I live and I was able to go and talk to him, um, but they're all gone now, the Royal Regiment guys anyway. Um, I believe the Essex, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, FMRs, they're all gone, there are two Calgary tankers, I believe. One was on the tour with us. He wasn't a prisoner of war. He got back off the beach, um, but what an incredible man. He's, I think he's a hundred, uh, but, but sadly they're just about all gone. Um, so a question here about, uh, did any of the Blue Beach soldiers get back to England that night or were they all killed or captured? And if so, what became of them? So yes, um, the reason I didn't include them is because the books, the stats say 65 got back and I have been finding 
guys who are not on the list. So I don't know what the correct number is at this point. Um, there's a man in Australia whose father won a, a, a very prestigious medal from the French government for what he did on Blue Beach. And he got back and fought throughout the war, but he's not on any of the lists. So yes, according to the records, 65 got back to England, mostly wounded. Uh, there was a Polish, uh, the Slazak, a Polish uh, destroyer. And that Polish sea captain saved just about all of them uh, by helping, you know, there were rowboats, there were all kinds of things trying to get the guys out. And um, some of them didn't make it when they got back to England. They passed away there. Uh, the ones who were fit and weren't badly wounded continued in the war. There were two actually that were killed later in the war with the Royal Regiment. And uh, the Royals basically had to rebuild the regiment because most of their regiment was, was destroyed. So um, yes, there were some that got back. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm sorry, folks, I'm going to have to wrap it up, but I'm going to ask you this one last question, Jane, because it's piqued my curiosity. Um, did your dad mention the sheep, which was brought back through the tunnel? The sheep? Yeah, so referring to uh, the same camp your dad was at. Really? Uh, the tunnel, yes. So this is from Mary and Jim. Okay. Uh, um, no. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but I can imagine they had a really good feed that night. <laughs> if that's the purpose for the sheep. No, I have not heard, heard of that. Um, I'm right now trying to do a bit more research on the tunnel because being at Stalagate Bee Museum, they don't know a lot about it, which surprises me. Um, they were doing an, a, an archeological dig there on the hospital when we were there and we were allowed to visit it. But um, yeah, again, email me with more details on that because I need to figure that out. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Martha and Jim, uh, get in touch with Jane with more information on the tunnel. Martha says, my dad was six two, so was one of the men getting rid of the dirt from the tunnel in his trousers since he was too tough to dig. Oh, wow, yes, and it was yellow, so they had to get rid of it somehow. So <laughs> that's amazing. Yes, please, dappbluebeach at gmail.com. Please email me. I'd love to speak with you all.